السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ولا وبعد uh, Last time we finished with ayah number 8 سورة number 59 named سورة الحشر A-L-H-A-S-H-R uh, so, in ayah number 158, the Qur'an was talking about uh, those migrants who were driven out of their homes, leaving their money behind or their money was taken away from them. They are seeking the bounties of Allah and they are seeking his pleasure and acceptance. And they are also making this migration to support the cause of Allah and to support his messenger. And it says, those are the truthful ones. Truthful here means they are true to their faith. Then this is talking about the immigrants who left Mecca based on the instructions of the Prophet peace be upon him to go to Medina. The Prophet was still in Mecca, but he told them, go to Medina. And definitely he pointed them to some contacts in Medina that they will reach out to, and they will be received by. And they were received quite well. So this ayah, ayah 58 talks, uh, ayah, ayah, ayah 8, I'm sorry, ayah 8 is talking about the migrants who left Mecca. There are lots of stories to show us the sacrifices they made based on uh, their faith and their willingness to leave everything behind. Some of them, their kids were snatched from within their hands. Uh, there is a story that a companion by the name Abu Talha was leaving with his wife and kid and the pagans caught him leaving Mecca to Medina and they told him, this is our son, this is not your son. You apostated, you left the deen of your forefathers. And he said, now I went back to the forefathers' faith the faith of Ibrahim and Ishmael. They didn't like it, so they caught the kid from his arm, and he caught him from the other arm, until the kid got one of his shoulders, one of his arms, dislocated from its position. And they took the kid by force. So people who migrated from Mecca to Medina were very powerful in their faith. They were badly prosecuted. So they left to protect themselves from further abuse and persecution and to join the messenger and to be steadfast in their faith. Then ayah number nine, which we start with today, it talks about the people in Medina. How does the ayah label them? It says, and those who had homes in Medina and had settled in their faith as they are settled in Medina, they love those who immigrate towards them. They love the Muhajireen of Mecca. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> and here the ayah makes the point that they migrate moving towards their brothers in faith. Many of them have never been in Medina. And their brothers in Medina had never known them before. So their first encounter was that these are people 
who run away from persecution, reaching out to the brothers in faith in, Mac in Medina, and they are welcomed with open arms and open hearts. The description of the people of Medina, those who have settled Medina before, oh, by the way, when the Quran talks about the people of Medina as those who settled in Medina before them, it is referring to the group that we call Ansar, the supporters. They are called Ansar because they gave support to the migrants from Medina. The description further goes and says that those early settlers in Medina, they have no desire in their hearts to anything that they have been blessed with by Allah, and they give priority over themselves to the migrants, even if they were in distressing need. Can you imagine somebody who doesn't find food for his family, but he gives food for someone just because this person doesn't have a family, doesn't have a home, doesn't have a business, he doesn't have nothing. And the ayah further explains that the the degree to which the Ansar, the people of Medina, were in need is so pressing that they see the needs of others above and they give it priority over their own needs. So Allah mentions this and he commends them by saying, and anyone and anyone who is saved from his own covetousness, his own miserly approach, his own selfish, self-centered ego, or he is not fully occupied just with his own needs. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Such are those who will be successful. So anyone that Allah rids his soul from selfishness, from covetousness, from misery, then those are the ones who are going to be successful. I want you all to look at the description here. Let us say we Muslims living in the West. We get, we get migrants from the Muslim world all the time. Why? Because Muslims nowadays under the oppressive regimes of the so-called New World Disorder they are always under the gun. So you get the Uyghurs, you get the Uyghurs, you get from Yemen, you get from Lebanon, from Palestine, from Iraq, from everywhere in Africa. They are coming here as refugees, meaning people who have been displaced and driven out of their own country altogether. The question is, do we really give them preference over our own needs? Or do we always prioritize ourselves over others? Until we prioritize the needs of those who need things more than we do over our self and our needs, that means we have not yet gotten ridden of our own covetousness. 
we need to work on ourselves. So when you exit your masjid or go to a shopping place and you see somebody who is a Muslim who is in need so much so that they are begging don't blame them don't rebuke them instead put yourself in their shoes and get your righteous soul to speak to their hearts and tell them you are my brother you are my sister i'm going to help you as much as i can this is where we need to practice the Qur'an the most. So the Qur'an is not a book of stories for those who lived before us. The Qur'an is a book of guidance. And this is how we need to engage ourselves with the Qur'an in a way that keeps our faith alive. This is something that we need to work on. Okay. Let us see. So this is the first ayah for today. And ayah number 10. And again, we are in surah number 59. And those who came after them those who came after those migrants and joined them in Medina, they say, O oh Allah, forgive us and forgive our brothers who joined Islam before us and do not make in our hearts grudges and hatred against those who have believed. Muslims should not be holding grudges against each other. Muslims should not hold envy and jealousy and hatred towards each other. Even when we disagree, we should be honorable enough to love people for their faith Even when they violate their faith, we should guide them, we should embrace them, and invite them back to the teachings of their faith. Why? Because we are all sinners. Every human being is bound to make mistakes. So making a mistake is not a reason to hate and hold grudges against each other. So they pray to Allah to forgive us and our brothers who came to Islam before us and do not fill our hearts with grudges and envious evil feelings against those who believe. O oh Allah, you are the kindest of all and you are the most merciful. Now, after talking about these two groups, the Ansar who are in Medina and the Muhajireen, the migrants who came from Mecca, now it is talking about a third group in the community. And the Quran doesn't mince words about where they stand. The Quran calls them by their actions because Allah knows them but the Muslims may not know them because they are spoken of in the Quran by their either title or by description but because their action 
is an action of the heart that comes out in real world by their choices they make in this life. The Quran calls them the hypocrites, saying, have you, Muhammad, not seen or observed the hypocrites who say to their friends among the people of the scripture who disbelieve by Allah, if you are expelled, we too certainly will go out with you and we shall never obey anyone against you. And if you are attacked, meaning in the battlefield, we shall indeed defend you. We shall help you. But Allah witnesses that they are certainly serious liars. They are exposed. To whom? To Allah. Why? Because when they go to the believers, they say, we believe. They join them in prayer. And they join them in charity, even though when they spend, they spend reluctantly. And when they stand for prayer, they are lazy about it. They have no motivation because the faith has not really entered their heart. They want to hold the stick from the middle. So they don't want to lose the benefit of pretending to be Muslims, and they don't want to feel or get the harm of showing that they believe. So with the believers, they pretend to believe. With the hypocrites, they are with them by their heart and actions. So the Quran calls them hypocrites. <clears throat> so a real hypocrite is someone who hides their disbelief and pretend to believe and act as if he is a believer. So the Muslims could easily be deceived by the hypocrites' pretensions. So the ayah is telling Prophet Muhammad and beyond him is a believer that haven't you seen to those hypocrites who speak to their friends, meaning the people of the book who refuse to accept Prophet Muhammad and accept Islam and accept the Quran. They even refuse to ponder or think about it. So those hypocrites tell them, listen, if you are expelled, and here they are talking to the people from the people of the book who violated their covenant with the Medina, with Prophet Muhammad. As a community in Medina, as we explained before, everybody signed that they are going to be primarily Medina residents or citizens, if you will, and they will stand in defense of anybody in Medina. They will not harbor any ill feeling or ill behavior against anybody living in Medina. But they go to the people of the book here, referring to the Jewish community who refused to believe in Prophet Muhammad. Because among the Jewish community are people who accepted Islam. But among them, the majority, they refused because they wanted that coming prophet to come from within their own tribe. But when it came from an Arab background, the descendants of Ishmael, they refused to submit and surrender to Allah. So the hypocrites reach out to that tribe, Ben al Nadir, the tribe that violated the covenant they signed on with the Medina, with the Prophet, peace be upon him. And they tell them, listen, if you are expelled, we're going to leave with you. <clears throat> Meaning, we're going to bring our monies and families and join you. 
even if you are expelled. And if you are fought, we are going to fight along your side, meaning against Prophet Muhammad and against the rest of the people in Medina. <clears throat> Am I talking too fast to you, Sister Mona? No, I'm sorry, Sheikh. I'm just I'm, I'm just from behind. I'm trying to catch up. I apologize. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I I noticed that uh, uh, it might be that I'm going fast. I don't know. No, 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 Sheikh. Please go ahead at, at your pace. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. So uh, this is. This is the covenant that the hypocrites wanted to give in support of the disbelievers of the people of the book who violated their covenant with Prophet Muhammad. And Allah SWT wanted to expose them. So he says, Allah is a witness that they are liars. In what way? Ayah 12. It says, surely if the Jews are expelled, those hypocrites will never go out with them. Why? Because Medina is where the business is. Medina is where the profit is made. Medina is where the trade takes place. So will they go out in the desert with them? So in any way, and if, if the Jews of Bani Nadir, the tribe that violated their stance with the Prophet, if they are attacked, the hypocrites tell them, we will help you. Allah saying, they will never help them. Furthermore, Allah exposes their inner intention. And if they show or pretend that they are really serious about helping them, the hypocrites will turn their back very quickly against the Jews and they will never be victorious. Then Allah exposes some of their reasoning the people of the book and the hypocrites okay certainly you the believers are more feared by the jews of bani nadir the their your fear in their heart is greater than their fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's because they don't understand, they do not comprehend. They don't know the majesty of Allah and the power of Allah. Meaning that their heart revolves around people and people's reaction much more than observing Allah's reaction towards what they are doing. So here is Allah exposing what is in the hearts of the hypocrites. And as we mentioned before, the hypocrites here are not just superficial hypocrites. They are hypocrites at the core because inside their heart they don't actually believe a bit. They just pretend. But ayah number 13 is talking about the people of the book in particular. And here it is all, it's not all the people of the book but that tribe 
and other tribes who would support them from the Jewish community against living up to the covenant they have signed. So in Ayah 13, it says, you are more feared. They have more fear of you in their heart than their fear of Allah. Why? Because they are blinded from seeing the majesty of Allah and recognizing his power. Then it discloses something about also the people of the Jewish community who have violated their covenant with the Prophet. It says, those will never fight against you even if they are all together except in fortified townships. Mind you, the Jewish people who have been persecuted all along their history Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends communities against them to try to bring them back to Allah to follow the commands of their prophets. And when they rebel, Allah keeps sending against them their enemies, people who take exception to what they are doing or what they are failing to do. Of commitments. So as we know, at one point it was the Babylonian Empire. At another point it was the Roman Empire. At one point it was uh, other enemies. So because they are always living among people who don't like the way they behave, they live in fortresses. They fortify a village or a township and they live there thinking that the walls of their fortress will protect them. So Allah is exposing them and their plan by saying, they don't fight you even if they were all united all together except in fortified villages or townships or from behind fences and there are two remarks in this ayah where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they don't fight you all together is one and then in the next sentence, he says, they only fight you from fortified villages or townships or from behind high walls. And then it says, their animosity among themselves is very great. So among themselves, they don't accept each other. Why? Because everybody wants to be the master over others. So their sense of what you may call by today's political terms, their sense of superiority is not just against others who don't share their tribal belonging or national origin or descendancy or even faith, their animosity is against each other because every one of their tribes thinks the next prophet's coming from me. I deserve it because other prophets came from my ancestors, not yours. Even though all of them are from the same children of Israel background. But Allah is disclosing what is going on inside their tribal divisions. It further says, you think they are all united together, but their hearts are further apart and more divided than you can tell. 
So you think they are all united, they are all one front, but they are not. And then it says, that is because they are a people who do not understand. When somebody doesn't understand, but they think they are the smartest in town, then it is to their own detriment. Because they are living a fallacy. They are deluded. deluded. Then A number 15, it gives the reader of the Quran an example. It says, they are like their immediate predecessors. Meaning, Banu Nadir are like Banu Qaynuqa, the, the tribe that violated the covenant before them. They tasted the evil result of their conduct. And in the hereafter, there will be nothing for them except painful torment. So Allah is doing the psychological analysis of what is in their heart what influences them, what is the perception, and what is the reality. The reality is they pretend to be together, but they have more differences and fights inside themselves than we know. They pretend that they are strong, but their strength is only in hiding behind fortresses, metal equipment, walls, that's all what it is. But inside themselves, they are weak and they are divided. Then the other example the surah gives us in ayah number 16, it says, their allies deceived them like Satan, when he says to a human being, disbelieve in Allah, but when a person disbelieves in Allah, Satan would say, I am free of you. I have nothing to do with you. I fear Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of mankind, jinns, and all that exist. amazing they they pretend that they can be your allies but it's all lies because it cannot hold water it is vague empty promises like satan when he tells you listen to me allah will not forgive you do you remember all the sins you have done and all the lust you have done after women, men, money, children, everything? Do you think that this is not something awful? You think Allah will forgive you? No, no. So when you listen to the shaitan, you end up giving up even on repentance. And that's why you get people who ask their sheikhs and scholars and imams, I did this and this and this, would Allah forgive me? Because the shaitan whispers to them and they listen to his whispering. But the shaitan is pretending. Likewise, they, when they say to the Munafiqeen and the Munafiqeen say to them, we're going to be with you, we support you, uh, we will stand with you, they are like the shaitan.
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 17, so the their fate, both of them, is that they both will reside in their abode in hellfire, that they will stay there abiding in it for good. And it says, and this is the payback for those who commit injustices. With this ayah, the story referring to what was happening in Medina between Muslims, the people of the book, meaning the, uh, the Jewish community, and the hypocrites, and the, the exposure of their attitudes by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will stop right here because the ayah, last ayah on the subject, sent them to hellfire so that nobody will have an excuse on the day of judgment and that also shows us that our choices in this life will shape our fate on the day of judgment their fate was sealed by their choices likewise Allah will treat us in the hereafter based on our choices so that's why the following ayah it starts off by saying "O oh, you who believe be mindful of Allah and be dutiful unto him and let every person look to what he has sent forth in advance for the day after In essence, Allah is addressing the believers and telling them, be cautious, be mindful of Allah, because you have seen the fate of those who were not mindful of Allah and what happens to them. So you must look ahead to observe and see with your own eyes your fate when you do something similar. Look for what you have advanced for tomorrow. The Quran is calling the day of judgment the morrow. We call every next day tomorrow because it's very close. A few hours, you will be in tomorrow. Tomorrow will be today. But the Quran calls the day of judgment as the final morrow, which means the last day. And that's why the day after is called the last day. Because after that day, there will be no tomorrows. It's a very horrifying concept that you remember that yes, there will be a day after this life that will be the last day to be ever called tomorrow. Because on the day of judgment, there will be never any tomorrow coming. Allah wa ta'ala will call on people on the day of judgment he will call on the people of paradise and say "O oh, people of paradise your life is eternal enjoy it without death you will never die and he will call on the people of hellfire and tell them you will be in there for eternity because in hellfire there is no such a thing as death.
it is something to think about. And ayah number 18 is saying, it is on you, the believers, to always be watchful and mindful of Allah and to look ahead. What have you advanced for that final morrow, that final day, that before it, you call it tomorrow? And be observant of Allah because Allah is all aware of all work that you do. And A number 19, it says, And do not be like those who forgot Allah, meaning not, not just forgot, actually ignored Allah. And Allah would ignore them as a result. In other words, if you forget Allah when you make choices, why don't you expect Allah to forget about you when you make dua? When you ask Allah for something, and when he calls you, you do not respond. But when you call him, you want him to respond a day before your prayer. This is not right. Something is wrong. So Allah is saying, don't you be like those who would forget Allah and Allah would make them forget themselves. Because in reality, you should never be able to forget about Allah. Even though the air we breathe is abundantly available for everybody, but Allah could make it impossible for a person to breathe on his own. He would need a pump, a machine, to give them oxygen they need. So don't take the bounties of Allah for granted. This is a lesson. Live a godly life. That's what the ayat are telling us. So don't you be like those who forgot Allah. And as I explained, forgot here doesn't mean like forgetting something. It is not from forgetfulness. It is when the Quran talks about a person being blind. It is talking about spiritual blindness or the person being without hearing or without the ability to speak, uh, uh, being deaf or dumb. It is not the physical deafness the Quran is talking about. We explained this several times, but as a reminder, the Quran is talking about spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness, spiritual dumbness. Likewise here, it is not talking about mentally forgetting Allah. It is about spiritually forgetting Allah deliberately. Which comes in the heart. This is not about mental capacity to remember or memory lapse. That's not what the ayah is talking about. Then A number 20 takes us again to think about the hereafter. So it says, the people of hellfire and the people of paradise are not equal. They are not the same. The people of paradise are the winners. 
So, in other words, the ayah is telling us, don't you just focus on winning at life here. Be a winner in the following life, in the following part of this limited, short-lived life. This is what we should be mindful of. This is what matters most. And this is where people have real serious difference in this life and in the hereafter. So the people who will end up being in hellfire can never be equal to people who are ending up in paradise. The people who end up in paradise are the winners. They may be materially losers in this life. They may not have lots of money here. They may not have lots of power here. They may be helpless, persecuted, militarily defeated, maybe the underdogs, maybe, maybe they are helpless. But in the hereafter, if they stand for what is true, they stand for truth in this life, and they push back against falsehood, if they stand for justice in this life, Allah will give them the ultimate power in the hereafter. They will be the winners. And this is not the opium of the masses, as the communist regime used to say. For a believer, this is as true as we believe we can speak. This is as true as our ability to see things. This is as our ability to digest food. All of these are faculties given to us by Allah. And we know that they are true faculties because we enjoy them day in and day out. But the believers even those who are living, swimming in the billions of dollars, they will be the losers. So what is the ayah really talking about? The ayah is saying, people who choose the path of paradise are different from the people who choose the path of hellfire. Huh. So it is all about our actions and choices here. Then, and number 21, it tells us, if we were to send down this Quran on a mountain, you would surely have seen it crumbling humbling itself, rending asunder by the fear of Allah. Here is the image Allah is giving us about a mountain. If it were to receive the Quran as we did, because before us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented the heavens, the earth, and the mountains with the amana, the trust, the covenant with Allah to be submissive and obedient. And they felt too weak to take it, too weak to carry it. But man accepted it. Man accepted the amana but he later proved himself to be a wrongdoer an ignorant creature in our ignorance we think we know everything <laughs> and in our arrogance we think we are capable over everything we have all the power. We think of our nation or ourselves as superior, superpower. So we act with this superiority complex. 
and because we know nothing compared to the knowledge of Allah, we end up hurting ourselves and others. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the example Allah is given to us in the form of a mountain, if it were to receive the Quran, you would see it crumble with your eyes out of the awe and the humility before the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the ayah continues and says, and those examples and parables that we put forth for mankind, we put them forth so that they may reflect. So mankind is here urged to reflect and ponder. I wish I could take some questions right now, but unfortunately, I have to go to my next uh, appointment. But inshallah, next time, we will be uh, picking from ayah number 22, surah number 59. Thank you very much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Please, remember to spread whatever good word you have picked from this class to your family and to those friends that are close to you because spreading knowledge saves humanity. Spreading the knowledge that comes from Allah is the worldwide security requirement. People kill each other out of ignorance and we should not fear anything more than ignorance. This is what creates those false superiority feelings. Ignorance creates arrogance. May Allah save us from both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Mona. Thank you, Sister Andalib. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.